So in this tutorial, what I want to go over is actually setting up Lua code to work as a, a Lua module, more or less. And we'll want to actually set it up so we can add it as a table file and um, distribute it that way. So that way we don't actually have to distribute both a cheat engine table and a file for it. Um, basically, the way I ended up doing this and what I'm going to go ahead and teach here is... Um, will actually custom use a function um, to import. So one of the first things we want to go ahead and do, and I guess I should mention this, um, and so I like to separate things out like I mentioned before. Um, so basically I like to create a Lua files um, directory here and then place any Lua modules in here. Um, and then realistically outside of this deal I have an actual you know Lua files folder that I keep all my table files in like that. Um, this way I only keep one copy of it and then I can just you know add it to different tables and it's only when I'm working on the module that I need to create one directly in where I store my cheat table. Um, I'm just going to keep working out of this directory just for now but we're going to create a whole new um, cheat table here and this way we can go through the full process and then also to try and keep this tutorial from being a 30 minute long ordeal because um, I've basically already shot this and used the um, the 64 bit one and turned all that Lua code into a module but it ended up being a really long video. Um, to me at this point you should kind of understand some of the basic concepts of that and how to do that um, and then here we'll kind of go over some of that to some extent but I just really want to focus on making a small module um, getting it so we can import it correctly and then just kind of showing how that works um, So here, let's just say we're gonna make our module. and We're just gonna call it cheat engine helpers um, And then one important thing to note is when we Actually make this use this import function. It's gonna look for specific file um, Extensions here, so we want to make sure whatever we use here for our loop, you know for our modules um, you always use the same and then you might have to edit the, the function that we end up writing to where it's actually using the right extension but that really won't be a big deal um, and so here I go with all lowercase for the Lua so let's say now we've got our, our module here and it's inside our Lua files folder and we just want to start setting that up um, so one thing to talk about is I often like to add some key functions here or some key variables that I end up using. Um, so one is the shorthand for translate. And then that way I can use that anywhere I want to and kind of deal with it. Um, a lot of times I may not actually add this stuff until I actually go to use it, but I just kind of want to do this and order on down the line more or less. Um, another one that's real common with um, Lua and even I see in Python a lot is to go ahead and create a format function and this way we don't have to do the full string dot format and that way we can actually just use format by itself and it'll work um, and then usually again just for clarity I like to make a, a, an empty string variable um, again, we can kind of, and a lot of times I'll actually go ahead and include this stuff until I figure out I'm not using it and then remove it later or just add it as I go. I mean, ultimately how you write your modules are, is un, you know, up to you and just whatever works for you. Um, so one thing to talk about here is when we actually set up this module, um, it's going to end up working much the same as, uh, you know, any normal little module. And this way you can... Um, I actually create shorthand and stuff like that. So a lot of times it's not a terrible idea to create that on a local level, but I actually still prefer to create the module itself at the global level um, and then just control what I expose through the module, but then I still like to return the module in the end. So this way it can be imported, you know, with a um, you know, local or just some shorthand variable for the module name equals require or in this case it's going to be cheat engine table requires what I end up naming the function um, and then our module name and then that way we can choose to use the full name 
or the shorthand that the user ends up coming up with or yourself whenever you actually import the module. Um, so that way it'll just be, we can kind of pick and choose how we do this. Um, one thing I always like to do is make sure I actually name my modules the same as the file name. So this way it's less confusing. I don't have to import one name and then work with it in another name and remember that. Um, and so basically anything in Lua that isn't a simple type like a string or even a function, even though that's not necessarily a simple type, but um, you know that or even an um, integer, I guess really in, in Lua it's, they're all numbers. They're not really, they kind of deal with it in different ways, but ultimately the type will just be considered a number. Um, but anything that's not that is a table. Um, so that's what we need to create to actually create our, our module here. And then, like I said, I like to make sure at the end, I always return the module itself. So this way it'll work just like a normal module on Lua will, and we can deal with it through that way and not have to have everything. But the nice thing about a module like this is also, and especially when you set up functions to only work through the module and not necessarily all have them declared globally, um, can make it so you can have your own functions without necessarily conflicting with names. So you can actually create your own AOB scan and not have to worry about it conflicting with the Cheat Engine one. Um, because you would only be able to really access it through, you know, the module. <clears throat> so one thing I like to do, um, it's mostly for debug messages and stuff like that. Um, I guess if you had enough lengthy code and you were using a shorthand in case you ever forgot, you could print this somewhere random and just kind of figure out what the name is. But I always like to include a name variable here. And then again, just actually name it the actual name of the module itself. There are some different ways that we could get this from the file name, but to me it's just as easy to, since it's kept up here with the main module part, you know, for us to keep track of if we ever do change that name for some reason or whatever. Um, and then another key one I like to always make sure I put in is a version number or a version string really. Um, that way we can just keep track of our versioning. We can do whatever numbering we want to do here. Um, just kind of depends on you and how you want to set it up. Um, and then again you can kind of keep going with this. Um, I'll actually go and open a one of my standard modules here that I actually do use. So, like this is kind of just to give a rundown of how I actually really do set a lot of this up. We can kind of look here. I actually like to do all this at the very top so that way I can keep track of um, exactly how it works and then I actually do generally give an actual class name and stuff like that. Um, again, naming conventions are entirely up to you. Um, I usually go ahead and include an MIT license in my modules just so this way it's very clear that, you know, whatever you want to do with this code is free for you to do. Um, again, some of that I'm not actually sure with it being through Cheat Engine, it, it may be different, but I just include that anyway, and Dark Bike never giving me shit on it, so. But again, um, so here we can kind of see, um, this doesn't actually exist in Lua, I don't think but I ended up including that anyway. Um, but basically, I end up just creating, you know, some stuff that I'm going to use later, and then I actually set up my module here. We kind of declare everything. You can go ahead and throw in an offer, very, you know, a, an author, and then a license, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then just start making functions. Um, so as you can see here, we can actually declare our functions in this same notation. Um, and that's basically what we're going to end up doing. But again, just for showing simplicity here so we don't get too complex right off the bat, we're just going to start with some simple stuff. Um, so one thing I like to do is say if I want a, a private variable, um, I generally won't uh, capitalize the first letter. I'll keep it lowercase. So we might actually do like a um, a private value or something like that and give it whatever value and this way kind of right off the bat because it's a variable I know that now um, another convention to even consider is um, giving it an underscore that's one that's real common in um, Python um, that's generally actually the way that you do that 
Um, and then I think double underscore is kind of a doubly private kind of thing. Um, but again, the uh, lowercase variables tends to work fine for me. The only thing to keep in mind is I do even publicly expose functions. I usually go ahead and make those lowercase to the first letter just because it makes reading it a little bit easier. Um, in this case, we really don't need that value, so we'll go ahead and get rid of it for now. And then, so anything I do want completely exposed, and I want it to be very clear that I mean for it to be interacted with, I often do start with a capital letter. So let's go ahead and say we have that setting. And then we've got another setting here. And we're just going to kind of make a dummy print function is all we're really going to do to just kind of show how a module works and, and that kind of thing. And then importing it is going to be the bigger thing we're going to go over here. Um, so like I said, there's different ways you can actually do your declare functions. Um, one way we can do that is actually create a local function. Um, and then let's just say we call that my print. And then here we just go ahead and say inside this function we just do an actual print. Um, we'll just pass that and, um, if I haven't mentioned this before. Basically the three dots in Lua just means all arguments. So this way, even if we send 20 arguments to this function, they'll all get passed correctly. Um, and that's also a way to do a catch-all. That way we could actually have, say, start and you know, end and that kind of thing, and then use those. But, uh, um, but anything after that would actually be this. Um, but we're just going to go ahead and pass everything directly to this print function just for simplicity. Um, and so with doing it as a local function, now of course this means that we could interact with it through just this deal, but then um, we could set it up so... Actually, yeah. And then this will set it up so it's exposed to the module. So this way we can actually interact with it through that. Um, now another way to do this, and this way it still basically works much the same way, is to go ahead and... The only difference here is we won't be able to ever interact with it in the local sense. We'll always have to do the full module notation. Um, again, that can be personal preference. Basically this is the way I end up doing it. Um, to me just so I don't get overly confused using it one way and then not using it another and stuff like that um, Some of that can just get kind of weird on you if you're If you've got both a local and a, a module one and you kind of go back and forth between using it here and Having to use a module outside of it and then using it locally inside the module um, If you don't really have an issue with that then You're, you're welcome to do it however you want um, Again because of the way this works another thing to keep in mind is we could actually do something like this in the end and then this way we could access a function both with you know a capital letter starting or a lower case we could just you know rename it do all kinds of different things um, none of that's really necessary um, so here to kind of show how our variables work let's go ahead and actually include some of those um, to actually use the module variables again, we'll have to use the full module notation pretty much. And basically that will allow us to kind of set something to always start this print off with, with and then something to always end it. Um, before we call it, we could change these settings, but again, once you change them within the module, it won't reset until you either change it back or you reload the module, more or less. Um, so here, we could continue with this and keep building more functions. Um, I think the basics of trying to, you know, understanding how to turn code into a mod, you know, into a function isn't too complicated, and I think some of the stuff I showed before should help with that. Um, so here we're just going to go ahead and worry about importing our module and being able to call this function. 
maybe even changing a variable or two here just so we can kind of show how that all works. Um, so let's go ahead and save our module. And then here I've already got this brought up just because I'm afraid with as much as going on in here I'll just get something wrong, um, some typo or something and then have to go back and correct that and explain the correction and then it, it, it'll just make this whole tutorial overly confusing because um, there is already a lot going on in this function here um, but basically we're just gonna end up and this will be one thing you would have to include with every cheat table um, to get it to actually work right because we need this function exposed just so we can start importing our Lua modules <coughs> There are kind of ways to get around that, and I've kind of got that set up in here, you can kind of see. So basically when I go to import a module, I check to see if that function exists, because this is another one of my table files, more or less. Um, and if it is in fact a function, then we go ahead and use that. If not, we just try and require the, the helper's module itself. Um, how you deal with some of that is kind of up to you but it, it just um, there's a number of ways to, to get around stuff and that's just one of the ways that I deal with this so this way I can still use this function but then at the same time have a fallback to a standard require if need be but at that point those files would in fact have to exist within the same folder as the cheat table um, but to go ahead and go over what this function is doing here um, so we set two local variables here. One's just the table Lua files directory. Um, and ultimately you can kind of see here how this is going to be set up is if this value is nil or an empty string, then we pretty much won't use it. It'll just actually end up looking inside. It, it uses, you know, local or relative files instead of um, full file paths. So the one catch with that is it actually works off the working directory. Um, and basically cheat engine will only set the working directory is when you either open a, a cheat table <coughs> um, so yeah I don't think it actually sets it any other way because I know saving it doesn't work um, like when we create it this when we first create this one we're going to have to save our table and then reopen it to get it to set the working directory so we can actually import from this directory um, if you forget to do that, you'll get some import errors, basically, because it'll tell you that it couldn't find the file, and you'll see that it's actually just looking in the cheat engine directory, more or less. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind when doing this kind of thing. But like me, I just get in the habit of I, I add all my table files, I set up my Lua script, and then I save, close it, and reopen it. And this way it, it sets the working directory. Um, and then we can go ahead and test the code at that point, make sure everything's loading right. Um, at least if you have your loot, your cheat engine Lua set up to always run, or at least prompt. Um, but here, so we've got our two local variables here, and so we set the directory name that we're going to want to look in. Um, that's up to you. Again, I just like to keep stuff separated, so this way I can have you know a few files in here, and I'm not going to end up getting confused or having too many files here um, but basically from there we go ahead and set um, our file extension and this just makes it a little bit easier in case we ever need to change that and here's where like I said if you want to use if you like all capital letters for your file extensions um, you can change that I don't tend to do that I mean I let stuff like cheat engine do it automatically and just leave it but otherwise I tend to explicitly prefer all lowercase. Um, but again, that's up to you. Um, so our cheat engine table require function here just takes a module string as the um, variable or as an argument. Kind of like I was showing here, you can see we don't include that file path or anything. Um, we just try and directly import it more or less and it works pretty much the exact same way that the require function does because um, ultimately it will return the module so this way we can use a shorthand and as you can see here here's a case where I actually am using a shorthand for it um, instead of having to always use this inside my modules I just use logger and this way I can set a local logger to that module and interact with it that way um, and depending upon how you write all your scripts um, if you make enough 
local variables and make it you know mod you know truly modular enough that's where you can actually have multiple instances so in that case all my modules have their own logger and that kind of thing and all I've got to do is set some key variables to tell it this logger belongs to this module and stuff like that and have it print out messages and, and you know in certain ways to give me error codes and stuff like that well not really error codes but error messages that I understand and know where to start looking we're not going to go into all that um, again so we get our module string here our argument and basically we just start off with checking for nil um, and then that way if, if we ever try to call that without or even a um, case we're using a variable and that's set to nil it'll just return nil and then this will I mean we could go ahead and throw an error here but to me I just go ahead and let it return nil and you'll get a um, likely when you try to use the module notation you'll get something like try to you know attempt to index a nil value and to me that'll tell me that the module wasn't set right um, that's up to you again you can have a print a message you know throw an error or do whatever at this point um, I just leave it returning nil and there's a couple other points where you'd want to throw an error like this would be another one eventually uh, but we'll get down there um, so we check our module string for nil and then basically if that's not we start doing the bulk of the code here so we start off with just a local table files file or local table lua file path and we set that to our module string to start with and then we check our table lua files directory variable here and make sure it's not nil and that it's not an empty string and basically if it's not either one of those um, we go ahead and just use packet config to get a um, a separator character for the file system um, I don't even remember why I set it up that way at first because this will never really run on Lua to some extent but at the same time on, or on, not on Lua but this will never really run on Linux but just because of the way Lua is cross-platform I, I did it this way for some reason but essentially so Linux or I think even Apple it would be that one and then for Windows it's gonna be the other the forward slash I believe that one's called um, so not too much to worry about there just the main thing is to understand that's you know a separator for the file path and then all we're really doing is concatenating you know that string with our module string so that way we can actually look for a local file path inside this folder if we need to or outside of this you know within the just a cheat table folder if we need to um, now since Lua doesn't actually have a direct way without either writing your own function or at the very least importing another module um, I can't remember which one it is in Lua I think it's Lua file systems or something like that um, but that's one that does have that kind of thing but again we want to be able to just start working from here and import our module so what we're gonna do is um, this one's kinda I go back and forth whether I would call this duck typing but essentially on some levels what we're gonna do is do what's known as duck typing and, and that stems from the idea of, you know walks like a duck quacks like a duck it must be a duck so we don't necessarily direct you know check correctly or directly say is this a file since we can't really do that but we go and try and open it as a file and if it allows us to open as a file it'll return a file and not throw an error and then at that point we can know we can just close the file and treat it like it's a file um, so basically at that point all we're doing is checking to see if this file path exists on the file system if it does then what we want to do is allow this to override any table files and the idea there is so that way when you're working on your module or making changes or trying to fix something or adding to it or whatever um, the local file will always override the table file so this way you don't have to re-add the table file every single time because do that you'd actually have to go into the table file delete the current table file by that name and then add the new one um, so to keep from doing that we go and have a way to override it with the local file um, and here we could just use require but I go ahead and use do file so this way again I can just keep executing that script and know that it's going to reload that module every single time and it's not going to um, store it or cache it which is what require does it'll actually only look it up once and actually run the code once and you would have to actually either clear it or rerun the file with do file and so that's what we do here <coughs> Um, 
Right, so then from this point, basically, if the file doesn't exist, and basically we don't get a file object, or we throw an error, we assume that the file doesn't exist, basically, when we come on down here. And then this is where we just use the cheat engine um, function here, the find table file. And at this point, we actually, even if we did concatenate this together, we don't want to use that local path. We want to just use the module string with the file extension, because that's how it'll end up being stored in the table file. Um, and so in doing that, we set a variable to what, you know, to what the table file finds, so it would be a table file, and then we just check for nil on that. If not, we return nil, or yeah, we return nil if the table file is nil, because we really can't do anything with it. Um, again, like I said, this could be another spot to throw an error, or print to your log, or do whatever. Um, that's kind of up to you how to set that up. Again, I just return nil and let them, you know, the rest of my code deal with that in some way. Um, even though most of the time I'll just, I don't even check, I just let it throw an error if it's going to do that. And it'll just tell me that the module doesn't exist to some extent. Again, it'll actually just say, um, attempt to index a, you know, a nil value, but I'll recognize a module name or whatever I'm using for the module and know that something wasn't set right. Um, but how explicit you want to be there is up to you. Um, but from there, if the table file does exist, we want to go ahead and create a stream for it. Um, and then from there, we just read our stream and we go ahead and read the entire size of the stream. So basically the full file is what we want to read. And we turn that into just some bytes and then from there we take our bytes and we iterate through the bytes and just turn each you know each byte into a single character and concatenate it that out onto our file string here so that way we just build a file string one byte at a time more or less um, I think there are some other ways to do it but this was just the way I ended up going with that worked um, and then from there if our file string isn't nil and this we haven't had any issues um, we go ahead and use load string on that file string and the main thing to note here is we actually need to execute that code so we need these extra parentheses here um, or else the code wouldn't actually execute it wouldn't actually run the module and load it correctly we would just return the full string is all we'd really be returning um, in this case it actually isn't the full string I can't remember it's been a while, but um, load string does do something a little different. I think there's some other things you can do with it, but in our case, all we're going to want to make sure is we just load, run that, whatever load string returns, we run that, and then that'll actually cause our module to return. So in the end, it'll actually return whatever the code we run um, ends up returning. So if it returned nothing, we'd return nothing. In this case, we're going to be running a module that returns itself when it's done. Um, and so that's what we'll end up getting returned. So this way it'll end up working exactly the same as do file. Um, so here we can go ahead and take take this code here and stick it in our table. And then just to kind of prepare us for this, we can go ahead and import our module. And again, we could go ahead and actually import it um, and just plan on using the global form of it um, this way. And so here we can go ahead and say, uh, did I name that my print? What did I call that? Yeah. And so then here we could go ahead and call our function. And just deal with it that way. Um, another way we can actually end up doing this is we could go ahead and set up a local variable, and this way we could have a cheap, you know, a shorthand for our, our module here, and then just interact with it in that way. And then again, we've also got those. Um, those variables we added to it so that way we could actually change those. Oh, I think I did string start. And then 
that way we can, you know, change settings and then run our functions or do however we want to do. So that way, in case, say, you stick that auto attach function inside of a, you know, or that auto attach code inside of a function and set it up to where you can just call it with the process name and have your defaults. But on another table, you want to change one of those defaults, you can, you know, kind of set it up in this way. Um, and again, we can, I mean, you don't have to do this with the shorthand. We could actually even do this halfway through and it'll work either way. Um, it really doesn't matter. Once we've created it, it'll interact with the module in the same way. Um, basically, you know, this is the one time where it'll create more of a reference to that instead of copying the full thing. Um, but so here, the main thing we got to remember again is that we actually need to change our, or save our our cheat table and then we'll have to close it and reload it otherwise right now we just get a lookup error if we actually try to execute that and we can kind of show this here you can see we actually got you know attempt to index a nil value global cheat engine helpers at line 41 which is that line right there because basically it, it can't find it because it's actually looking in the cheat engine directory. Um, but so ultimately we saved our table here, but if we go ahead and reopen it, it'll automatically run that. And you can kind of see here that we've got, you know, our first hello world here. I must have put a space in somewhere. It's something goofy. But anyway, we got our first hello world there. And then this one, we actually added that. This is the start, and you can see how it's, you know, it, once we import the module, we can either use our shorthand, we can use the, you know, the global, and it'll still refer to the same module each time. Um, but I do think, like here, this one would actually be a different module temporarily because the way this thing works and it runs the code each time, we could actually set this up. So, so let's say we do it like that. Mm -hmm. Let me clear that again. But I'm thinking that's kind of illustrating. And that's how, like, I was talking about with that log module you do have to import it each time and that's where that um do file part can come in because this way it'll actually rerun the code and it'll make a different version of that module to some extent or a different instance of that module um, but also keep in mind with doing that we're creating multiple instances of this you know module so if we don't really need to do that we're going to be using up unnecessary memory and that kind of thing um, so there are instances like with that logger that you might want to do that, but most cases you probably really won't. Um, so now from here, the thing we can go ahead and look at is we want to actually be able to add this. And so if we add that module file now, and then save again, what we can go ahead and do and kind of test this out and to show what's going on here is we can rename this folder for a second here. And then when we load this, it should actually have to load that that table file because the, the one on the file system doesn't necessarily exist as far as it's concerned because the folder's not here. Um, and we can see we've executed our code correctly and all that's fine. Um, so the next thing we can kind of show here is how it actually does import that each time and we are in fact using the local file on top even if we have the um, the table file in there we can go ahead and just print the simple debug message more or less and let's just print the um, name of the module here and concatenate it with you know loaded just so we know it loaded right Make sure we save that. Okay, I don't think I changed anything here, but we'll go ahead and save anyway, just to make sure. Um, but then when we load this, we'll actually get that, you know, each time it loads the module, 
and then you know as you can see whereas if we go ahead and go right back to this we don't have that message in the table file um, so it won't load that and that's one way to you know make it a little bit easier to work on your modules and deal with um, making up you know add new code or fixing a bug or whatever the case may be um, I think that was pretty much all I really wanted to go over on this one. Uh, let me make sure I bring... I don't think you really need to see the module. I'll bring this back up just in case I still need to copy some stuff or type this out. Um, I may, I'm actually going to go ahead and try at least on the Fearless Cheat Engine forum. I'm probably going to throw this in a code block just so you don't have to type all this out and make some dummy mistake. You know, or not even dummy mistake, but just some simple mistake like I know I would. A simple typo somewhere or something like that you can just go ahead and copy this function and kind of look it over and try and understand what it's doing um, again you could even slowly take out pieces that was one of the things I often do when I'm first learning a new language is you know, if I start off with something I pull from you know stack overflow or from a tutorial or whatever I might start hacking together the function just by copying and pasting bits of the code until I really understand what's going on um, but again, how you do that is up to you. Um, but the important thing to note here is just that this kind of thing will make it a little bit easier on some levels um, because the idea here is if you're making even a cheat engine, um, an actual cheat engine trainer, not you know a, tra a true trainer with your own language or you know C sharp or whatever, um, or C++ would really be the better one for game hacking. But anyway. Um, there you would really have your own code and you know in that same language and just deal with it that way but this does make it to where repeating certain tasks and doing stuff like that um, some examples here we'll go and show so like you know so I've got my table CEA because I like to actually import CEA files as well I may go over how to set something like that up at some point but not right this minute um, and I have table helpers. I actually have a you know a teleporter, so this way I don't have to constantly write a bunch of different code the same. I can always just use this module, and then just change settings and you know interact with it that way, and just store stuff and you know t deal with my teleporter. Um, you know the complexity of your code is just you know it's up to your imagination and your you know willingness to just type you know get on that keyboard and be a true hacker and hack at that keyboard until you figure it out. Um, you know, I've heard a lot of arguments on where the name comes from, but I've always been more with that kind of name. Um, and that's what a true hacker is, is just you hack at that keyboard day in, day out. And every time somebody says, well, where's Matt? It's, he's hacking at that fucking keyboard again. Um, but that kind of thing is, um, So then we, you know, I've got a logger and then a deal for, I don't know if you've ever used any of my tables, but cheat engine table state is one of the other ones I use. And I mean, so you can do a lot of different things with this um, and just simplify tasks and make it to where you don't have to always copy and paste. And you can imagine with all these modules, I mean, as long as some of these get, um, that would be a lot of code to include in all the table files. Um, one of the other things I can't actually never really double check to see how much it compresses but um, one thing we can look at here to go back to that so if we open this in a text editor we can kind of see here how that module that we've got here ends up just being this um, and oftentimes I've noticed it seems like those really long modules get kind of short um, so I actually do think it does use some kind of form of compression here as, as well. Um, this may actually just be the actual Lua bytes that it needs, you know, for um, Lua byte code. Um, again, I'm not actually sure how Cheat Engine does all this, but it does seem like it helps with file sizes and all that as well. Um, but the big thing is it just makes your code more modular, so this way you don't have to have a, you know, a, a Lua table file or a Lua um, a table Lua script that's a mile long and then get confused on where is this part where is this coming from you can break it up pretty good and, and really get your code more modular and cleaner and just be a little and hopefully be a little happier with it um, 
I know that was one of the things I, you know, because I, to me, when I code, it's, you know, I love modular code. It just always made sense to me in every language. Um, so that was one thing when I was working with Cheat Engine at first that I really did want to set up. Um, obviously, a lot of stuff you can't really do that with within Cheat Engine. Some of it's always going to be, you know, process specific. But then there are a lot of tasks that we can simplify, like auto attaching, um, updating the cheat table, setting it so we can automatically update the cheat table for the user, and just whatever else kind of things you can come up with. Um, that's pretty much it on this one. I don't think there's really anything else to talk about. Um, so, hope you learned something, hope you find it useful, and have a good one.